Wait. I am alone with three children in my house. It's been hit. My window's been broken. We got about a hundred trailers hit. It's a mess out here. People's furniture was coming in my windows. My furniture was getting sucked out. And our house was popping up and down like popcorn. And I remember going, holy mackerel, looks like a bomb hit here. Like there was nothing left. Trailer's just totally flattened. Like if anybody was in them, I'm thinking they had no chance to survive. I was so scared. I just wanted to scream and scream and scream. From the Weather Channel, this is Storm Stories. July 31st, 1987, Canada. In Edmonton, Alberta, the day breaks with unusually warm temperatures and high humidity. By noon, the mercury reaches 81 degrees. Severe thunderstorms out of the southwest are forecast for the afternoon. 30-year-old Marin Wilson lives in Evergreen Mobile Home Community with her husband and four boys, whose ages range from 10 months to 11 years old. While her husband is away at work, Marin plays outside with the children. She notices the unusual weather conditions. I was sweating, and I, we don't usually sweat here because the weather's very dry. And I thought that was really odd. Things are about to become even more strange. By 2.45 p.m., storm clouds develop about 10 miles south of Edmonton. They intensify as they mingle with the humid air. High temperatures and moisture create rising columns of air called updrafts. These updrafts start to rotate as they ingest rolling tubes of air that are flowing in from the south. They are creating something extremely rare for this Canadian city, a tornado. And when emergency, there's a funnel cloud touching the ground just uh, southeast of Beaumont. At 3 p.m., Officer Bill Clark receives several reports of tornado sightings on the southern outskirts of Edmonton. But he assumes the information is false. That's because the city has never been hit by such a violent twister. People in this city wouldn't know what a tornado was if it came and hit them in the face. You know, nothing ever happens in the big city of Edmonton that's of that magnitude. The tornado quickly morphs into a monster. It's an F4, just one notch below the top of the tornado scale. Winds are estimated at more than 200 miles an hour. The base of the twister stretches a half mile wide. It touches down in an industrial complex and lumber yard just east of downtown. Then, the twister heads about eight miles north, directly toward Evergreen Mobile Home Community. Marin Wilson looks outside the window of her trailer and sees the clouds rolling in. And these clouds are just zipping across the sky, and I thought, wow, look at that. A few seconds later, the power goes out. The wind starts to pick up. What Marin sees next is shocking. One guy's roof blew off his house, and I thought, whoa, check that out. And I was kind of laughing, thinking, man, is he ever going to be choked when he gets home? Marin still has no idea that a tornado is about to strike. She walks outside to bring in her children's toys. Then the winds swoop into her yard. The wind kind of blew me right through the fence, and I thought, oh, strong wind. I guess that's why his roof blew off. This is, like, really strong. Marin quickly runs indoors. Within minutes, her mobile home begins to shake. The eaves on the roof start to tear. Then, the full impact of the twister bears down on her trailer. That was like two by fours coming through the walls. That was a big, big, loud sound like a train or a plane. And, and our house was popping up and down like popcorn. Marin, already holding her 10-month-old baby, grabs her two-year-old from his crib. I could see the black, it was like black wind and all stuff in it. People's furniture was coming in my windows and, and my furniture was getting sucked out and, and it was just like, uh, it was totally incredible. Marin and the kids are trying to run for cover when they see the neighbor's mobile home lifted off the ground. Looking out the window, we saw this trailer go up in the air and just blow apart and and there was really no place to go. She and her four children searched desperately for a place to hide. So we tried to get in the closet, but it was all full, and, and we were trying to get out of my bedroom, 
They huddle just inside the door well and wait for the shaking to stop. I was just praying to God if it was time to die that please don't leave one of my babies to wake up in this rubble. Police emergency. I can see it now. It's a big black twister. I am alone with three children. My house has been hit. My window's been broken. Police emergency. I'm all alone and I think there's going to be something happening, a hurricane or something. 911 calls pour into Edmonton's police station. Officer Bill Clark gets word about the Evergreen mobile home community. I heard a policeman come over the air on the radio. And I remember him saying, Control, half of Evergreen Trailer Park's gone. And I just went, holy mackerel, we better get out there. He jumps in his patrol car and speeds away, arriving just moments after the tornado moves on. And I remember getting out of the police car and just looking around going, holy mackerel, looks like a bomb hit here. Like there was nothing left. Trailer's just totally flat. Like if anybody was in them, I'm thinking they had no chance to survive. Amazingly, Marin and her four children have survived the F4 twister. Marin begins digging out of the pile of debris surrounding her front door. When she and her family emerge, they are stunned by the devastation. I was thinking it looked like I was in a garbage dump. I was watching people grow out of the piles of rubble. Like it just all of a sudden something would grow and it would be a person. The area is plastered with car parts, mangled telephone poles, and broken furniture. Most of the surrounding trailers are completely flattened. Marin's is still standing. The trailer that smashed into her two-year-old's room prevented her house from being lifted off the ground. Luckily, Marin Wilson and her children have no serious injuries. She leads them over the rubble that once housed their friends and neighbors. I didn't know where to go to keep them from seeing all this horror. They board a local bus carrying all non-emergency victims to the nearest medical facility. From the window, Marin can see a man holding her neighbor's seven-day-old baby girl. She rushes out to help. She was soaking wet and she was black and blue. And she was so tiny. She takes the infant to Officer Bill Clark. She looked like she was in a, a trance, like walking out of a movie. And she just walked right over to me and handed me this baby. He wanted to know who she was. <laughs> and um, I knew where she was born, what time, how many pounds she was, but I couldn't remember her name. I took the baby and the baby was bleeding. There was a bit of whimpering to it. I uh, wrapped the baby in the blanket. I mean, I have a son that at that time was four months old and then this baby was small compared to my son. I just thought, man, I, I gotta make sure this baby lives. Officer Clark drives the infant to the nearest emergency room. Marin and her children are transported to a hospital about a mile down the road. There, they see the baby's mother. She's screaming at me, I can't find my baby. I'll never ever forget that. Marin informs the mother that her baby daughter is safe. Later that afternoon, mother and baby are reunited. The twister has killed 27 people, including 15 from the Evergreen Mobile Home Community. More than 300 homes have been destroyed. The people of Edmonton rally together to help the victims, donating whatever they have to pay for the $330 million in damages. Boy, when something like this happens, everyone forgets their troubles and they go, hey, this is much more important. They pull together, it's phenomenal. In the years since the tornado, Marin Wilson has remarried. Her oldest boy has grown up and lives on his own. But Marin still struggles with memories of the disaster, especially during tornado season. Yeah, the clouds turn black and I'm like, I don't do it well. Sometimes I'm able to just phone my husband if he's at home and say, you know, and, and I know they're laughing at me. Okay, everybody check in. Mom's going to be phoning in a panic. And if we're not here, she's coming. Even so, Marin refuses to leave Evergreen Mobile Home Community, the place she calls home. I need to stay here to be safe. It's really weird, but if I let that storm make me run, then I've lost any sense of control that I have, and then it will have beaten me.
The Edmonton tornado was Canada's deadliest twister since 1912. While tornadoes are rare for Canada, ice storms are common. They can cause widespread power failures and water shortages, creating life-threatening situations. That was the case in 1998, when one ice storm in particular proved to be the worst on record. That's next, when Storm Stories returns. Monday, January 5th, 1998. It's early morning in southern Quebec, and the temperature is 21 degrees Fahrenheit. An ice storm leaves a frosty coating on trees while creating a trail of freezing rain over the region. These storms are hardly an anomaly in Quebec. The area shares a southern border with New England and receives an average of 45 to 65 hours of freezing rain a year. This is something that may happen anywhere between November and, and March. So uh, uh, it, was, it looked like you know, the kind of freezing event that uh, we've seen in the past. The freezing rain continues falling steadily for the next 24 hours, covering everything in its path. The icy scenery is a welcome change for 39-year-old Alain Pepin and his 74-year-old father, Georges. The two men live together in a small community just 20 minutes south of Montreal. Alain captures the eerie landscape on his video camera. Well, it was beautiful. We thought, oh, it's so lovely. All the trees are covered with this ice and it makes sort of a postcardish look to the city. And uh, everything was fine. But little does Alain know that this ice storm is about to become one of Canada's worst weather nightmares. By day three of the storm, the danger is more evident. Meteorologist Dennis Gosselin arrives for work at Environment Canada. He's shocked when he sees the latest weather data. I received my, my, uh, my maps, um, then I realized that uh, something major was coming and the uh, quantities that were forecast by the, uh, the numerical guidances that we use uh, were also quite scary. Weather maps show a very slow moving storm system coming from the Gulf of Mexico. It will continue to pump moist and unseasonably warm air northward for several more days. Meanwhile, temperatures are predicted to remain below freezing in southeastern Canada. This combination of warm over cold air is deadly. Snow was actually melting in the warm air and then freezing uh, when it touched the ground in the cold air. And the humid air mass will continue to enhance the heavy rains into a shallow layer of freezing cold air near the ground. Sure enough, by Thursday, January 8th, Montreal and the surrounding areas are wrapped in sheets of ice four inches thick. Quebec's power company, Hydro-Quebec, announces that hundreds of their major power lines are down. In many places you had uh, trees you know, that were broken, branches falling off uh, uh, on the street, trees that were, that were partly uh, obstructed by branches and ice and all sort of things. A staggering 1.4 million households are now in the dark including Alain Pepin. That creates a serious predicament for Alain, who is caring for his elderly father. When I got really concerned about the situation is when I heard on the radio that uh, major power lines had collapsed. That's when I knew we were in for a long stay without power. The only thing that we could do was to put on more clothing. I slept with my snowmobile suit and uh, that pretty much kept me warm. Chief Ron Barron of the Montreal Fire Department knows this is a large-scale emergency. It's the worst he's experienced in 24 years on the job. Ron begins walking door-to-door -door, along with police and military personnel to check on some of Montreal's three million residents. He is stunned at what he discovers. We came across several cases where people were actually suffering from hypothermia. They were in sleeping bags, they were in blankets, but when you looked at their extremities, their fingers, their lips, they were actually turning blue. If we wouldn't have intervened, maybe within an hour, maybe several hours, these people wouldn't have been with us. Thousands are forced to flee their homes for local shelters. Others stay home and use dangerous tactics in an attempt to keep warm. 
we started to see people with candles, people with makeshift cooking apparatus that were having little fire start. We had people in apartment buildings that were sleeping in their cars with the engine running and therefore creating carbon monoxide. Alain Pepin and his father discover they are running low on food and lamp oil. Alain must brave the storm to make an emergency trip to the store. However, Alain's car is covered by four solid inches of ice. If we wanted to use the car, we had to chisel with a hammer, chisel the door, the ice from the door, and just try and get inside that way. Alain drives in the icy conditions to a local gas station that's running on a generator. Once there, Alain gathers supplies to bring back home to his dad. My father had set up a car battery in the kitchen and he would light up these two lamps that, that, uh, that he set up. We would melt, try and melt part of the butter so we could just have some spread on the bread and just eat that. Alain's 74-year-old father is strong and in relatively good health. But the ordeal begins to take its toll on both father and son. We couldn't go to the restaurant. We couldn't get any heat. We couldn't get any food. We probably eventually couldn't get any gas. Uh, that's when we started her, uh, worrying a lot. To make matters worse, the freezing rain is not letting up. Emergency workers scramble to get the power back on in Montreal and its surrounding areas. Hydro-Quebec now predicts some areas will be blacked out for weeks. Chief Barron and his men are still going door to door, working 12-hour shifts to keep up. The rescue workers themselves are deeply affected by the powerful storm. Their own families had no heat, no hot food. Personally, myself, I had been without electricity at home, without heat, without power, for over 48 hours, and I was going on towards 72. By Friday, five days into the storm, 80 hours of freezing rain has hit the region. That's more than the area might typically experience in an entire year. That day, the rain seems to finally let up. But the situation takes another bad turn when the mercury drops below zero Fahrenheit. Alan realizes that neither he nor his father can survive the bitter cold. There was no way we could stay at home. We really had to find a place to go. Friday, January 9th, 1998. In southern Quebec, Canada, it's day five of the most powerful ice storm on record. Alain Pepin and his 74-year-old father, Georges, are frantically looking for a warm haven, but they discover that local emergency shelters are already filled to capacity. Desperate for a place to go, Alain drives to a nearby nursing home where his 79-year-old mother lives. The building is running on a generator, and caretakers offer to house Alan's father. Now, Alan must figure out a plan for himself. I had been monitoring radio stations from the States uh, for the last few days and waiting for, uh, for a confirmation that the roads would be open across the border. I would go across the border. Alan quickly gathers some of his belongings and gives them to his neighbors for safekeeping. He then flees south into the United States. I know that if I had waited one more day here, I probably couldn't have gotten the car out of the driveway. Alain spends nearly a month away from his home before power is finally restored to everyone in Quebec. The ice storm of 1998 proved to be the most destructive natural disaster in Canada's history. More than 20 people died. Thousands were hospitalized for storm-related injuries. Elderly residents were particularly affected by the long weeks without heat. Less than a year later, Alain's father Georges passed away. Alain sees a connection between his father's death and the incredible ice storm. I know that the following winter, there were a lot of deaths in the community. And uh, while it is not proven that the ice storm actually caused a death, it seems that a lot of people couldn't face the next winter afterwards. The ice storm of 1998 had the greatest impact on record for Quebec. And even for the toughest Canadian, it was an experience to remember. If statistics are right, um, uh, we're not going to see an event like that uh, for as long as we live.
because it, it was truly exceptional. To this community, it's the biggest thing that ever happened. It's the biggest event. The ice storm of 98 was so severe that Canadian troops were activated to help out. We'll tell you how many were deployed and why it made history when Storm Stories returns. So how many troops were called in to assist in Quebec's 1998 ice storm? At its height, 16,000 troops worked to help with the crisis. It is the largest peacetime deployment of Canadian forces in the country's history. For Storm Stories, I'm meteorologist Jim Cantori. Your local forecast is next. This is the worst storm in the history of the 